They're among the most ancient life forms on Earth, their ancestors tracing back to the very origins of life itself, before there was even oxygen on the planet. The algae. 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 Over half the oxygen you just inhaled was produced from algae. The term algae includes microalgae, the microscopic organisms that form the base of aquatic food chains, as well as macroalgae, the larger multicellular seaweeds that provide habitat and food in marine ecosystems. Recently though, these organisms have emerged as a potentially revolutionary resource for the 21st century. Look closely and algae is a wonder crop. Marine microalgae are able to grow in salt water at rates over an order of magnitude higher than those of land crops and without pesticides, producing biomass that can be used for fuel, food and fertilizer. The question is though, is the hype really justified? Or should you just stick to the kind of seaweed you put around your sushi roll? My algae is a company based in Edinburgh, Scotland. They cultivate microalgae in 30,000 litre fermenters to be used in a dried form for primarily fish and pet food. Okay, so what's the big deal? The fish farming industry produces around half of the fish we eat today. And whilst it reduces pressure on overfished wild fish stocks of the fish being farmed, it's certainly not without its own environmental concerns. One of the problems lies in the fact that fish require omega-3, a family of fatty acids that are vital to their and human health. But this is something which they cannot produce directly. Instead it's produced by, you guessed it, algae. Traditionally big farmed fish like salmon obtain their necessary omega-3 through consuming fish meal made of small oily fish like anchovies. These small fish are wild caught, accounting for around 20% of all wild fishing, and the majority of which could be eaten by people directly. And so fish farming like this puts great strain on global stocks of these smaller fish and the ecosystems they support. What my algae have essentially said is, what if we can cut out the small fish and feed farmed fish, the algae, the thing that actually produces the omega-3 directly? But that's not all that makes this a good business proposition. My algae cultivate their algae in wastewater from whiskey distilleries, which is rich in the nutrients that the algae consume. It is then a nifty circular solution, which my algae state will save 620,000 fish and 40 tons of carbon dioxide per ton of algae they produce. Last year, the company were named finalists of the British Prince William's 2024 Earthshot Prize. They have also secured funding for an industrial scale production facility, which, when completed, will be capable of producing 3,000 tonnes of omega-3 per year. But algae as a food source shouldn't just be limited to feeding fish, nor should its benefits be restricted to its omega-3 content. In addition to the macroalgae or seaweed already consumed as part of our diet, microalgae is increasingly being looked at as a source of protein, vitamins and nutrients for human and livestock consumption. Population growth and global development is putting increasing stress on modern agricultural systems. This is compounded by the need to produce crops not only for human consumption, but also for livestock feed and other plant-derived products, all of which compete for arable land and water. The microalgae food market is currently dominated by two primary strains, chlorella and spirulina. In the US, Greenstream Farms is growing microalgae at a 96 acre outdoor facility, the second largest of its kind in the world. It uses salty water that's unsuitable for traditional crop cultivation and sunlight to produce algae for pharmaceutical products and feed supplements for livestock. But how good is algae actually as a food source? An article by the BBC states that fresh microalgae has a protein content similar to spinach, but in its dried form this can vary from 30 to 60% by weight. For reference, soybean, which is commonly used in animal feeds, has a protein content between 35 and 45% and uses about 10 times more land area. Algae is also a valuable source of B12, a vitamin typically lacking in plant-based diets as it's primarily found in meat, dairy, fish and eggs. There is still though little research into the true benefits of algae for direct human consumption and how well our bodies would be able to access the nutrients it contains. In addition to being a food source itself, algae can also enhance growth in the form of biostimulants and biofertilizers. 
The use of chemical fertilizers is increasingly debated due to its nitrous oxide emissions and pollution of groundwater. Algae extracts contain plant hormones like auxins promoting cell elongation and cytokinins that help with cell division and nutrient uptake. Algae biomass is also a source of macro and micronutrients, sugars and amino acids. The company Alga Energy already has an industrial scale facility in southern Spain, using carbon dioxide emissions from a combined cycle power plant and sunlight to grow algae for these products. I think it's important to mention at this point that algae is often cited in the literature as a method of carbon capture. However, this claim can be slightly misleading as any captured carbon will eventually be released during decomposition, unless it's somehow permanently sequestered. Instead, it's probably better to think of it as a method of carbon utilisation. Algae requires carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, the process that converts sunlight into chemical energy stores while producing oxygen. Thus, the greater the concentration of carbon dioxide we have, the faster the algae is able to grow, and so alga energy uses carbon dioxide rich flue gases from a power plant as its source. Alga Energy supplies their solutions to 4 million farmers around the world as of June 2023, which have enabled them to reduce their chemical fertilizer use by up to 20%. This is a wastewater treatment plant. Wastewater treatment removes nutrients from water like nitrogen and phosphorus to prevent environmental issues such as eutrophication, protect aquatic life, and meet regulatory standards. But these nutrients aren't waste, they're actually valuable resources that were originally found in the soil. So what if we could somehow change wastewater treatment methods so that this resource could be recovered for reuse? A 2016 study found that growing the algae strain Chlorella vulgaris on municipal wastewater reduced the total nitrogen and total phosphate content by 65 and 71 percent respectively, providing an effective way to treat sewage with reduced chemical input. Using algae in this way has two other advantages, namely that it produces a source of oxygen and a low-cost biomass product that can be used for other applications as mentioned above. The oxygen production is important for wastewater treatment as it helps support aerobic microorganisms that break down organic matter, as well as inhibiting bacteria or pathogens that prefer anaerobic conditions. Algae can also remove heavy metals like lead, cadmium, copper and zinc through bioabsorption, binding metals to their surface, or bioaccumulation, storing them within their cells. The biomass produced from this use, however, would have to be repurposed for non-food applications like biofuel production. And that brings me very usefully onto the final category of algae use considered in this video, which is for liquid biofuels. I've left this till last as it's probably the most controversial in terms of its likelihood of adoption. The triglyceride or lipids found in algal biomass can be synthesized into biodiesel using the same method used currently for other plant oils. The difference though again is that algae can grow 20 times faster than other energy crops like maize or rape. Most of the cost in producing the biomass in this way comes from the cost of producing the microalgae itself, due to the high fertilizer, carbon, and utilities costs associated with it. But using this algae simultaneously as a way to, for example, treat wastewater as mentioned above, could provide the economic environment to make this a potentially attractive solution. The market, however, has mixed views on this. In December 2022, Exxon pulled out of a 14-year research effort into this technology, and many other oil giants have already done the same. But there are still some people who believe this can work. Viridos, who are based in California, are probably the largest company looking to make this a commercial reality. The company, who had lost Exxon support, received $25 million in funding in 2023 from none other than Bill Gates, Chevron, and United Airlines. The company claimed that their genetically modified algae can be used to produce biofuels capable, according to them, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 73 to 88% compared to conventional fuels. These algal oils can then be converted to jet or diesel fuel for a variety of applications. The algae again is grown outside in sunny, dry climates using atmospheric carbon dioxide and salt water. 
To conclude, I think the real value of algae as a resource lies in its application to circular processes, basically requiring us to start thinking in systems and cycles. Algae in a single process won't be a competitive fuel and fertilizer production or carbon capture method. But use algae to treat sewage whilst capturing carbon from a hard to decarbonize industrial process and then use that biomass to create biofuels or fertilizer, then you have an extremely attractive proposition. I hope you found this video engaging and let me know if you have anything to add in the comments. As always, I'm Luke and this was The Upshift.